Hello, dear friends, and welcome to this week's reflections here in Duffus Church. Now, Jenny's having a well-earned week off, so it's my privilege to bring to you a few of my own thoughts, along with the help of Sheila, Chris, and Michael. Now, in these strange and scary times we're living in at the moment, it becomes more and more important to think of each other and remember to keep in touch with the elderly and the lonely. You know, when life is filled with contradictions and paradoxes, distress, threats, trials and testing, when at times we might feel that faith will fail, disorientated and shaken, yet we're assured that Christ will hold fast. The way of Jesus is the path of suffering and glory. As God's chosen strangers, we live amidst paradox and contradiction, making it a bit harder to do the right thing. Yet we need to be assured that Christ will hold us fast. Faith finds home in Christ. Reassurance that Christ is the anchor of our souls, that we are not forgotten. Christ is preserving, keeping, and guarding us. This is our imperishable and living hope. Christ will hold us fast. So with that in mind, let's just have a few words of prayer. Loving Lord, I approach this day expectantly, trusting in the fullness of your mercy and grace, no matter the path before me. I look to you for reassurance as the one to preserve, keep and guard my life and my faith, to hold me in your keeping throughout the day. In you, Heavenly Father, we find refuge and strength. In Christ, we are rescued and restored. In you, Holy Spirit, we are overwhelmed by amazing grace. You clothe us, and above all, you embrace us in your love. So, in gratitude, let's repeat together the words Jesus taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now, Sheila will read to us from the Old Testament from Isaiah. Sheila. Our reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 43, reading verses 1 to 7 and then 18 to 21. Let us read and listen together. Israel, the Lord who created you says, Do not be afraid, I will save you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. When you pass through fire, you will not be burnt. The hard trials that come will not hurt you. For I am the Lord your God, the holy God of Israel, who saves you. I will give up Egypt to set you free. I will give up Sudan and Seba. I will give up whole nations to save your life, because you are precious to me, and because I love you and give you honour. Do not be afraid, I am with you. From the distant east and the furthest west, I will bring your people home. I will tell the north to let them go and the south not to hold them back. Let my people return from distant lands, from every part of the world. They are my own people and I created them to bring glory. But the Lord says, do not cling to events of the past or dwell on what happened long ago. Watch for the new thing I am going to do. It is happening already. You can see it now. I will make a road through the wilderness and give you streams of water there. Even the wild animals will honour me. 
jackals and ostriches will praise me when I make rivers flow in the desert to give water to my chosen people. They are the people I made for myself, and they will sing my praises. Thanks be to God for this reading of his word. Our theme today is Embracing Change. Addressing his fellow exiled Jews in Babylon, Isaiah recalled some of the momentous events in their past history, including their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. But then he immediately warned his contemporaries against becoming so preoccupied with the past that they fail to realize what God is going to do in the future. The Lord says, do not cling on to events in the past or dwell on what happened long ago. Watch for the new things that I'm going to do. It's happening already. Isaiah believed it possible to be both faithful to the past and at the same time open to God's action in the future. It would surely be strange if the God who in the biblical story continually does new things suddenly stopped calling his people to be open to change, to adapt to new situations and the challenges of a very secular world. And in the words of the very Reverend Dr. James Simpson, a man who I've quoted many times, as you know, the church is called to be the body of Christ, not his corpse. And he carries on to say, to cling to the past and past ways is to run the risk of missing out on God's new things, as the Pharisees did 2,000 years ago. Embracing change does not mean abandoning tradition, because the latter has an important role to play in the life of the church. Now, during these surreal times we're living in, it's important to remember many of us have lived through changes in the way we do church. We, like many congregations, have an aging majority and well able to cope with more changes. We have grown up in a church society which has gone from a fairly formal, dutiful type of worship to the more open, relaxed, and for the most part, happy worship group we've become. So we're not necessarily aged and grumpy, as may have been suggested on occasions. I remember a story about a minister while on holiday with his wife and grandchildren took his little grandson for a walk on the beach. And as they walked, they met a disgruntled elderly gentleman from one of his former congregations. The man's moaning and groaning was aggravated by his having had a touch of sunstroke. I think it must have been the Hopeman Beach he was walking on. Shortly after, continuing their walk, the wee lad looked up and said, Grandpa, I hope you never suffer from a sunset. Now, I'm sure all of us know people who, as they grow older, live in what I'm tempted to call the objective mood. They become more critical and cynical. Such was the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes. He took no pleasure in growing old. For him, it was a sad time of waning strength dimming vision, weakening and trembling limbs, a time when he said, the mourners go about the street. Now, Ecclesiastes says little about the compensations of aging, but there are many. And it's time when our perspective on life can change, when we see more clearly what things matter most and what other things don't much matter at all. Now, the former editor of Punch, Malcolm Muggeridge, expressed it well, and many of you my age and older will remember that rugged face on late night television. And he said, when I embarked on the voyage of life, I worried about having a cabin with a porthole, whether I would be asked to sit at the captain's table, who were the most attractive and important passengers. I see now how unimportant all such considerations are. The passion to accumulate possessions, to be noticed and envied, is now too evidently absurd to be entertained. How true. 
life's latter years can be a time of blossoming, a time of fulfillment. I can think of people with faces lined with wrinkles, and I see one in the mirror every morning, yet people of whom it can be said, like a white candle in a holy place, so is the beauty of an aged face. I'm sure we all know people who, though they have grown old on the outside, have not grown old on the inside. I'm told that often the more gnarled the cherry tree, the greater the profusion of blossoms. Or to use an analogy, the oldest wine bottles often hold the most delightful wine. Now my hope is that I will die young in spirit and outlook as late as possible, that I will grow old without resentment, self-pity and bitterness, that I will continue to see each new day as a gift from God and feel an urgency to use it well. Many good tunes have been played on an old fiddle, you know. We're not really old if our song is not sung, our spring has not sprung, and our fun is not done. I recall a 75-year-old man, no names mentioned, who objected to being called elderly. He associated the word with being incapable, joining the Sunset Brigade, those who are on the way out and sinking fast. He expressed well my own feelings about the ageing process. There's a lot of sugar at the bottom of the cup, you know. And again in the words of the Reverend Simpson, though now an octogenarian, he says, I keep telling myself that 80 is the new 60. For me, the evening of life is not a time for mourning the passing of the so-called good old days. It's a time for continuing to enjoy those enriching hobbies and pleasures which our health still allows. Spending more time with family and friends, enjoying the beauty of the world around us, reading books and listening to great music, renewing old friendships, making new friends, and continuing to use what time and strength we have to help those whose needs are greater than ours. The evening of life is also a time to pause and give thanks for the goodness and mercy which has followed us. So, if we have to, we can surely wait a wee while longer before we have the pleasure of all meeting again in our three sanctuaries. And let's hope at some point we'll all sing God's praises together. But I know we can and will accept change in whatever form it takes, because that is what we're doing right now. James Barry, the author of The Ever Young Peter Pan, put it well. He said, God gave us memories so that we might have roses in December. We certainly have an abundance of those right now. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, a prayer from the July edition of Life and Work, which so beautifully conveys our present situation, but again, ever-changing. Eternal God, in this strangest of years, as we have watched winter bloom to spring, unfold to summer from behind our windows and doors, speak to us, God of promise and hope, that in your shaping hands you hold all time, the quick and slow, the full and empty, the wasted and well spent. Present God, in this strangest of years, as we have heard the voices of loved ones from afar and communicated with many, but not face to face. Speak to us, God of promise and hope, that with your gentlest, calmest voice, we may find your reassurance that in good time, we will meet again with those with whom we have been separate. Understanding God, in this strangest of years, as we have seen our plans crumble or go on hold, and we have found it hard to focus and concentrate and be resilient in our thinking, untangle our minds, that we might piece together steadily our way ahead, one step, one day, one hour, one moment, beside our thoughtful God, 
whose paths already lie beneath our feet, prepared to lead us on. Loving God, in this strangest of years, take us by your hand, and with your smile, forgive, encourage, and set free each child of yours, each church, community, and land, that healed by grace, emboldened by your love, we may, with daring faith, resolve our hearts to face the future, confident that our future, now as always, invites our discovery and our trust in you. Amen. May the blessing of God unfold you. May God's love light all your way. May the grace of Christ guide your footsteps and the Spirit empower you each day. Amen.